What's going on, Trophy Kids? We've got an awesome show for you this week. It's our college football episode. So we're breaking down Michigan State's huge win over Michigan with the Big Ten boys. We're talking about big problems for some coaches in the Big Ten, Wisconsin's future in its season. We're giving out how we see our top ten college football teams right now. And we're going into the big games and giving out our bets for this week. It's a good one. Let's go. And welcome to Trophy Kids presented by Bad News Media. It is November 6th. As always, I'm your host, Nate. We got the fellas here from the Big Ten, Tim and Dante. How are we doing today? We are doing fantastic. It is <laughs> 70 and sunny in Michigan, which does not happen past November. Yeah, I'm doing well, too. Uh, I had a great weekend, but uh, now I'm watching these election results, so uh, maybe not so great. <laughs> Dude, it's been, it's been a week. Right now, we're recording this. Remember, remember the 5th of November is the day in which we're recording this. And it is, I will remember this 5th of November for a long time. I'll remember this entire week yes. because I have slept barely at all uh, tuned into this every moment. Um, wearing a hat today. I'm not a, usually a big hat guy, but because I haven't really been sleeping, I woke up a little late for work today. Made the long commute from my bedroom across my apartment to my little like office area. And uh, just threw the hat on because... A little known fact, while I do have fantastic hair, I get the worst hat hair slash bed head in the world. So, do on the hat. Haven't showered yet. And uh, that's where we're at. <laughs> that's the week yeah. we're having. <laughs> you know, hopefully it'll, it'll be over soon. Hopefully. I could hope. I have uh, <laughs> my anniversary is this weekend. And we're going, we're leaving town just to like get out of the city for a day on Friday night. Um, and my girlfriend immediately texted me like, "We are not watching nonstop election coverage on this <laughs> weekend." And I was like, <laughs> "She knows you too well." Fair, it's fair, fair. For a long time. Yes, yeah. seven years. Here's how awesome she is. We um, because obviously football is my life at this point in the season. Our anniversary is techn technically the seventh, so it's Saturday, uh, and one of our buddies is having like an outdoor event. He's a Notre Dame fan, so his, his family's coming down. He invited us down for, like, a big potluck dinner type of thing, watching the Notre Dame game. She switched. She was like, you, we can switch our plans to Friday so that on our anniversary you can go watch football and do that. And I was like, fuck, yeah, let's do that. So <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> that is how awesome she is. That's why it's lasted seven years. One, my dead good-looking charms, and two, she's fantastic in that area. So, um, All right, let's talk about some other fantastic news. And what I am sure you are both happy about, so I will give the floor to you to open up this episode. Your Sparties, King of Michigan yet again. For those of you who can't see, they're holding up their Michigan swag at this point. For those of you listening to us on our audio files. How are we yes, feeling? Uh, Michigan State pulled off what uh, it sounds like the impossible, but uh, you know, if you know anything about coaching and big games and Jim Harbaugh, this uh really wasn't that uh, surprising. It is great for Mel Tucker getting his uh, first win against Michigan, uh, first coach to beat Michigan in their um, first year, all the way back uh, before that it was Nick Saban. And then he's, the, I believe he's the only coach to record their first win ever against Michigan. So shout out to... Uh, Mel Tucker, and obviously, shout out to um, Ricky White. Ricky White is amazing. Stud. Stud. I said that <laughs> in my video. Amazing. Him and whoever 34 is on your defense, phenomenal Antoine football Simmons. players. Yeah, Simmons. Simmons. That dude's is insane on defense. Nuts. That man is literally so that, involved in every play. Yes, and that is just kind of a look into what it's like to be a Michigan fan, <laughs> is to have your quarterback go up to the podium after a loss and say he didn't really know who the middle linebacker was for his biggest rival. Now, they might say that we're not their biggest rival, but I got news for them. They haven't beat Ohio State in a very long time. Very long time. You're and their the most competitive rival, we'll say that. Oh, uh, biggest, I, don't, I think, I, I would say Ohio State's still their biggest, but close, mo closest competitive. In their, in their minds, not in Ohio State minds. Yeah, yeah that's you, fair. Yeah. 
how can you call somebody your rival and you're just getting curb stumped by them year after year? Oh, we'll get into the that. The only in a year moment. you lose, to, the only year you beat them is on a interim head coach on the year that they're riddled with um, scholarships being taken away from them. Yeah, it's it's crazy, but. Michigan State went out there. Come on, a, a down th- a, a three touchdown underdog. That was the greatest and win. <laughs> this is the greatest win that I I've ever witnessed. Props. Mel, Mel Tucker can literally do no wrong this year. Props he to has myself. completed his objective. Who who said that was a cover? I said it. I did not think you were going to win, but I sat here last week and I said to him that number is way too big for Michigan to cover. Not a chance. Did I? Did I not text you guys from the game asking you guys for to talk me down from thinking that they could win? You did. You did. You I'm did. Just saying. You did. I talk. I, I you texted did. you before the game saying, "Guys, I need some help. I'm thinking that we can win this. I, I, I can't go through a game like that." Yeah, I guess we too. Like, I, it's hardly ever do you see a team make every adjustment that they needed to make from the loss before, right? Teams always say, coaches always say, yeah, we're going to make the adjustments. We're not going to drop the ball as much. We're going to make sure that we uh, pick up our blocking assignments. We're going to make sure that we, if something is working, we keep going back to that. And Michigan State went out there and stuck to that game plan, sometimes to their detriment at, at that, oh. you know, watching that game, um, and, and got the win. I mean, no turnovers. Ricky White just burning Michigan's corners and um, keeping defense very simple, very simple schemes, nothing crazy. You know, most of the times they were in man. Sometimes they dropped to zone every once in a while, once in a while, but not missing um, their assignments The you know, D, the D line uh, picking up every man that they could uh, allowing Simmons and some of our other players to, you know, uh, pass rush a little bit. Um, it, it was great. It was something to watch. It was incredible. I was thrilled with everything they did, with all the adjustments they made. I mean, I even tweeted it out a little bit. Jet sweep. I was yes. actually happy about it. That has never happened in the past, like, five years where I was actually happy to see a jet sweep because it worked. And yeah. they actually called it at the right play yep. to the long side of the field, not the random short side of the field like they would stupidly do before. Um, I'm still a little nervous about what's going on with Elijah Collins, but they won, so it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Yeah, the the jet sweep too. Like when it when it happened and it worked, I was just like, don't <laughs> don't run it again. It ran it again and it worked again. I was like, Man. I didn't realize how bad Michigan was trying to set an edge, right? They and other teams are going to exploit that. Teams with better um, players are going to exploit that. Mm-hmm. So now you got to worry about your edge defense and you got to worry about your corners being a liability. Might be a long season for Michigan. It's going to be a long season for Michigan. Part of the going into that, I said, like, on the that number was too big because literally the only thing you had to do was not turn over the ball seven times and you're automatically a 10 times more competitive football team in Michigan State. And that seven turnovers is an aberration. Like, that's not going to happen again. Um, but making that adjustment, the offensive game plan was perfect, the defensive game plan was good. And it just came also down to Michigan, like they're not their their defense is a detriment because they're they are a defense that leaves their corners on islands and their corners are not good enough to be on islands this year and that's the scheme and they don't they don't make that in game adjustment um, yep. because if they had made that in game ju- adjustment, I don't know if they would have won the football game, but it wouldn't have been so obvious that like oh there's a problem in the secondary they just refuse to make the simple adjustments. Um, and that's sort of Michigan's story, which I and think they're handsy. They are handsy. About that. Oh. <laughs> and uh, Michigan fans think that that game got stolen from them by the refs up here. So um, when you grab a player, a flag sometimes gets thrown. Michigan State knows that. Michigan does not. And well, I mean, blatantly grab a player. Grab, grab their whole arms. You know, their whole arm while you're – of course a flag is going to get thrown. Your jersey could just be turned a little inside out, and Michigan fans would be like, "Eh, you know, he was just getting a little handsy. It was a, it was a tough play." Yeah, it. Well, that kind of leads me into my, I guess, the next segment, perfectly, because there are two programs in the Big Ten that are at 
they're either past their crossroads and heading in a direction or they're at a crossroads because you saw the same thing with Penn State and getting blown out by Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Penn State and Michigan have questions as to where they go from a coaching standpoint because there's two approaches I think you can take to this, and the first approach they're not going to take, it's not the way winning programs should approach their coaching situation, but they can either both accept that this is what they are at their core, like the, the glory days are sort of over, you have to be okay with being maybe once in a while you'll get a big win against an Ohio State, maybe, which isn't really happening, and have a chance at the playoffs. Sort of by sheer luck, outside of that one year, you're just a very competitive football team. You're a very good football team, but you're not really threatening for the playoffs. Or you got to get cut your losses and start somewhere new. Because James Franklin, right now in his seven years, and I, I love Jay Franklin as a person, but when it comes to the big games and against the opponents in the Big Ten you have to beat, he is bad. He's 1-6 and six against Ohio State. He's two and four against Michigan. He's two and four against Michigan State. He's one in or two and zero oh against Wisconsin, which is good. And he does play. Penn State plays Ohio State the closest out of anybody in the in the conference right now. But that's not good enough. And then you look at Jim Hardball. He's two and three against Penn State. He's three and three against Michigan State. He's zero oh and five against Ohio State. And he's two and two against Wisconsin. Like that's not like not, what do you do? Not here? only that. Here's another stat for Jim Harbaugh. He is 0-14 as an underdog. Yes. Which is insane. I don't... How do you not pull off a win? I don't know. uh, As an underdog. Like, that's kind of your defining measure as a program. Like, yes, you're going to be an underdog in a game, and you have to figure out how to pull it out. Mel Tucker's already done that in his first year, in his second game. The other thing why I think, like, this is much worse for... um, Harbaugh than it is Franklin, which it is pretty bad for Franklin, is the stat that you read that says he is three and three against Michigan State. You as a coach at Michigan cannot be three and three against MSU. That's just that's unacceptable. Especially these last six years. Little brothers smacking big brother around way too frequently for a Michigan coach. Um but that's the problem. And you're at the crossroads because I you could make the argument and we'll get into this week with their game. If they win this game, it's kind of that reset game where you can make the argument he's getting good recruits, but he just, for whatever reason, has gone over the hump. And typically they pin it on the quarterback, and Milton's going to be a good quarterback, I think. So you could make the argument, do you give hardball until Milton kind of prospers and see where that leads you, or do you cut your losses How many now? quarterbacks does he need? That's, so here's the so other problem. That's the other thing with – with Harbaugh, he's only got two years left. Like, how can he recruit for the future if he's only got two years left? Like, do you want you can't sign him to a big deal the way he's been performing with the hopes that Joe Milton might pan out? Well, here's the other so issue he can too recruit in this equation for both these schools because I think both these schools have a, a decision to make that will will either set them back or kind of keep them the same. Luke Fickle is going to be available after this year. And we're going to talk about UC in a second here. He is going to be available for a Michigan or Penn State job. If they were to fire their coach, you know he wants to stay in the Big Ten, he would go to Michigan or Penn State. The only reason he didn't go to Michigan State is because of all your problems there and potential scandals. But he would have left for that. So he's not staying at UC. That's just pure fact. Like, that's not going to happen. And those two jobs, would be he's going to get a big job with what he's doing this year. I guess with Luke Fickle, this is definitely a biased opinion for Michigan State, but I feel like Luke Fickle might be at UC to hold out for when Ryan Day jumps to the NFL because he was very close to Mark D'Antonio at Michigan State. Now, nothing went down correctly with Mark D'Antonio's exit either, so there could be something to that, and I guess we'll see how bad Mark D'Antonio's exit was this off season with what Luke Fickle does, um, because I truly do believe he would have come with he would have come to Michigan State if Mark D'Antonio brought him to Michigan State, which is what he should have done in my mind. And by should have done, I mean Mark D'Antonio should have brought Luke Fickle to Michigan State for us. Um, so we will see. I I don't know that I see Luke Fickle going to U of M or Penn State. I see him holding out for Ryan Day 
Ryan Day's job, to be honest with you. Yeah. I guess I just don't. I can't picture Luke Fickle at Michigan. I guess I have an easier time picturing him at Penn State just because I don't know a lot about Penn State. But I just feel like he wouldn't. If he couldn't handle the pressure of the scandals at Michigan State, there's no way he can handle boosters at Michigan. Well, I think it was more for him. It wasn't so much handling the pressure. It was more of like, I know I'm going to get a big program, so why go to a program that might get sanctions against it when I know I'm going to have an offer? If it's not from a big program in the Big Ten, somewhere in, somebody in the country, a big-time program, USC is going to have an opening. I don't think he'll go West Coast. But like big-time programs that can throw big-time money at him are going to try to. Now, you know we know he likes the Midwest. He likes the Big Ten. He can recruit the area really well, and he knows it really well. That's why I'm just thinking, like, when you look at the programs, Wisconsin doesn't need a head coach. Ohio State, yeah, he could technically hold out for. Um, but there's no other really big program except for Michigan and Penn State that are in positions where they might need a coach. And if you're one of those programs, can you risk letting a guy who wants to be in Big Ten country potentially leave the Big Ten and not risk it to get him? Because those numbers, like, James Franklin has had seven years to do better. And he's only yeah. one in six against Ohio State. So how much more time do you give him? Jim Hardball, he's zero in five against Ohio State. He's never been competitive against Ohio State. He he's dead even with Michigan State, and he's barely edging Penn State. So I don't know how much more time you can give these guys because then the problem becomes who do you find to replace him? Because you can't like Luke Fickle. We know is a very good coach, and wherever he's going to go, he's probably going to succeed. There are a dime and a dozen guys that are going to get you past where Penn State and Michigan are right now. Yeah, I guess the one like uh, the one good thing about um, Penn State is that in 2016 they did go to the Big Ten championship. They did, and that's so, yeah, and that's part of yeah, the equation like, with Franklin. I feel like I feel like and they won. So I feel like uh, James Franklin kind of is kind of what Penn State is and what they've always been, but Jim Harbaugh is a different story. Yeah. I think he's lost his mind. <laughs> it's quite possible. I'm just throwing it Actually out there that those two like, programs. I think, I think JT Barrett broke that man. Like, I don't think we'll ever see what Jim Harbaugh is again, ever. Possibly. Yeah, that's very possibly true. I, um, you know, I just think Jim Harbaugh got too comfortable or is too comfortable. Like, if I was in that position, I would be. What incentive does he have to win? Other than... Well, Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, you you can see there's a clear screw loose in that man. And there always has been a screw loose, but at least he had a screw loose, like, with a passion for winning. Now he's just got a screw loose. Like, yeah. he doesn't know what he's talking about or how to even motivate. Like, he just looks lost when it comes to a press conference or even that series on Amazon. I was watching that thing. I was so was not happy when yeah, I was watching it because his brother came in and gave an incredible speech, and it was night and day from what Jim has been had been spewing all season. And it was like he's a broken man. Yeah, I think my favorite part, although it probably shouldn't be, and maybe I shouldn't say this, is when his wife was like, I hate it when Jim loses because he just tosses and turns in his sleep all night when he loses. <laughs> oh, he's got to be miserable to be around after a loss. Oh, oh you know he's miserable. absolutely. Oh, you know it. I'm I'm bad to be around when Michigan State loses, and I don't even play football. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Lions or Michigan State, Teresa leaves the house. So. Um. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. I'm just saying, and I, I guess I should also clarify, once again, I like James Franklin. I think for Penn State, he is Penn State, but by sticking with him, y you are saying we're okay with being very competitive but not really being a threat because he doesn't he doesn't coach well in big games, and it was that once in kind of a blue moon, yeah, they, they punched through one year, but you look at it, they can't beat Ohio State, and he, he coaches bad. Like, he doesn't make good decisions late in big games, and that's why they consistently find themselves out there. But they're yeah. always going to be super competitive. They're always going to be considered a top-10 team with James Franklin. Like, if you're okay with that, which is sort of Penn State in a nutshell. I mean, like... That's kind of yeah. how they've always that, been. Yeah, that's... That's, that's kind of how they are. That's that's always been Penn State. But that's why also, I'm saying they're at a crossroad. You either have to decide you're okay with that, or do you risk it to potentially lure in Luke Fickle, who might take you to the next level and bring you to a status... 
where you are on the same tier potentially. I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but potentially on the same tier as an Ohio State. The, the other thing I think the Big Ten needs to do is not play this game where it's Ohio State and then Michigan and Penn State are second tier and then MSU, Minnesota, whoever else, Iowa is third tier. No, no, no. This, in the Big Ten, it's Ohio State and everyone else. Yes, 100% once, right now. Once the Big Ten realizes that, once these Penn States and Michigan realize that, they can have a better time at, you know watching football. It'll be much more enjoyable. But as long as you think that you're second tier – you're not you're not you're not close to osu you're not getting the same recruits you're not performing the same way and you're just not going to get that that consideration of the playoffs unless you go undefeated but to the, on the flip side of that neither will ohio state maybe can lose one game maybe maybe yeah but you know ohio state also has to go undefeated too it's just not there's not enough room in the big 10 yeah. we're not the sec you know i agree and i also if i was a penn state fan I would be happy where we're at because we're not Michigan. We are, I think, and I'm saying we, I'm not a Penn State fan, but if you're a Penn State fan, I'd be acting like we're arguably consistently the second best team in the in the, the uh, conference. Big Ten. Yeah, yeah, the Big Ten. Like, we're, we're arguing that. We're the toughest team that we play at Ohio State outside of this year, the toughest out of any team in the conference generally. Um, and we are usually second place yeah. or a second or tier team. Is. Wisconsin, right. You trade back yeah. and forth, yeah, and you, you have back. a shot at a big-time bowl every year like that's that's good and you know at some years you're going to be just competitive enough where you might catch ohio state at your place and that's exciting like i think yeah. that that's good for yeah. penn state i'm all for that i'm just and saying they have a decision to make <laughs> penn state has been in that position a few like over the last couple of years last few years they've been in that position a couple of times michigan literally has only been in that position once this yeah. whole time with jim harbaugh that's why michigan only is once a real disaster i do think <laughs> yeah. I think it is time to try to make, and you have to make the split amicable because Jim Hardball is a figure for Michigan. Oh yeah, but I do no, think he's it's, a they, god. Yeah, he's a god. They but made him that way. Though. <laughs> yeah, he's he a god. Beforehand, they made him that way. You have yes, to, I they think. Did. It, they did, yeah. But I think it is time because there are like you're missing out on the Mike Novells of the world, who I think are going to repair Florida State. You're going to miss out on the Luke Fickles if you don't get rid of Jared Hombo. You're going to miss out on the Jimbo Fishers when they're moving. I mean, he's not moving, obviously, but like when he moved, like you have to be they a should not hire Jimbo Fisher. I'm not saying they should have, but there are these big <laughs> coaches that move that you're missing out on by kind of keeping this dead weight because he just, unless they beat Ohio State this year, I, I say you give them the year. But I don't no. think that's going to happen, but unless they do that, I don't see, mm. unless you're going to say give him until Joe Milton, but at the same time, then you're sort of wasting Joe, Joe Milton. No, I really think the way Michigan has to go is I think they have to go with an up, young up-and-coming coach. Like, I don't think that they can hire an up-and-coming coach or a well-established coach like a Luke Fickle. I guess, I guess Luke Fickle's kind of the exception. Um, but I think they have to go with, like, a Mac. Like, they have yeah. to hire the next P.J. Fleck. They have to hire... The guy out of to the uh, what's his name that went to Iowa State from Toledo. Like they have to hire like they have to hire the next up and coming head coach. They have to hire the Mike Norvell out of Memphis. They can't and be going like the like next big. Luke they can't Fickle go is. like the next. Yeah. I said Luke Fickle's an exception. Oh, I thought you said yeah. okay, okay. I thought you said not no, a Luke Fickle. I, said, I was like he's I, not an established I said Luke program. Fickle's an exception. I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. Luke Fickle is like. The next guaranteed big time head coach in my mind. I don't think it's a question. He's going to it's, Texas. It's more of a question <laughs> of if he's going to if he's going to Texas or if he's going to Ohio State when Ryan Day leaves for the NFL. That's really my only question <laughs> with Luke Fickle is which program is he going to decide to try and take over? I agree. Yeah. So um we meant also the culture at Michigan has to change. That is a big Oh, 100%. oh, big thing. The arrogance is yeah. They have, gotta... the the arrogance that they don't have any right to have is incredible. And you saw that right after the game with Joe Milton, and then with uh, what's his face saying that they weren't Josh Gaddis with him saying that he didn't prepare his guys well enough. It's like, well, okay, I get your quarterback not knowing the middle linebacker's name as like a joke, but. After you lost, it's one thing if you don't know about them and you beat them. 
it's another thing to just kind of dismiss a guy that had a game like Antoine Simmons did, and you lost to your rival. I and now on the fluke play, there was no rain. There was no funny wind. Nothing None, crazy nothing. happened. <laughs> yeah. You just got beat. Got beat. Got beat like coach. a drum. Um, we've mentioned their name a couple times. I think before we get into the games, we have to discuss Wisconsin here. Wisconsin, like the state, is getting ravaged by COVID right now. And they haven't, they have said they have not had any severe symptoms, but it is moving through the team. I think it's what, like 27 players or something at this point? Yeah, 20 something. It's definitely 20 plus. Yeah. It was definitely more than 27 because I think that was it on, it was like 24 on game day. And then like on Monday or Tuesday, it was 27. I've heard 27 a little while ago. So it might have went up since then. I don't know though. Where are we here? Because I, I think the season's at risk. Do they bite the bullet and just create buy buy opportunities for every game they have on their schedule for those teams at this point? Because it is, it's bad. Like I don't know how you how you put together a season right now with the protocol in the Big Ten. That's the thing. I don't know how they do it with the protocol of the Big Ten. But yeah. if they hold out for one more week, they pretty much get most of their guys back, or they get a they get their quarterback back, which is really all that matters. Right, because he's supposed to come back. He's supposed to be eligible to come back at the end of the 21 days, the day of the Michigan game, because the test was from Friday, the day of the game. Well, isn't it 21, 21 days plus the cardiac test? He does have to pass a cardiac test, too, right? Yes. How long? Because that's the issue with uh, Trevor Lawrence. Is I don't. He doesn't. He's not going to have the cardiac test passed. That part I don't by know. By the new, uh, Notre Dame game, because he's technically going to be cleared from a from a sitting the thing out about standpoint. Trevor, the thing about Trevor Lawrence, though, he has symptoms. Like he does, which right. wasn't also, just right. like How? he wasn't just like tested positive as like a no an asymptomatic guy. Like people have been talking about when is he coming back? When is he coming back? Not like. When is he clear from COVID? Like, <laughs> right. when is he going to be healthy again? Like, I don't care when he comes back because he actually had symptoms of COVID. Now, maybe it's not like a severe case, but he didn't just go into the testing protocol because he got randomly tested positive. I know this isn't Wisconsin, but sort of on the Clemson point. How the hell have they not had more positive tests? Well, they had a bunch right before the season started. They had a right, ton. but like... Did everybody on the offense gain immunity? Because Trevor Lawrence is your quarterback, so he's sort of around everybody. Well, I mean, there was that was there was those rumors that LSU was just letting all their players catch it, right? There so, were those rumors, yeah. So maybe. <laughs> I guess there it's a were possibility. those rumors, and somehow suspiciously, suspiciously, Ohio State has not had a positive test, and they made it through all of summer practicing together. So let's uh, move on. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, let's not. Let's not. We got enough conspiracy theories. This week. So yeah, let's just. Let's not, that was my fault for bringing that up. <laughs> any any uh, thoughts? Final thoughts on Wisconsin here before we. Uh, I don't know if Wisconsin makes it through the season. I don't either. I don't know. They do either. I feel like they're almost like, I feel like they're almost the martyr of the Big Ten. Like they have to fall on the sword in order to keep the Big Ten going. I agree. I mean, it gives every team on their roster now a bye week. I mean, it doesn't give the entire conference a bye week, but it gives the teams they are playing a bye week, which allows mm-hmm. some more flexibility for the Big Ten to operate if one of their teams goes down, especially given the area that COVID is affecting the nation the biggest is sort of that part of the country, the Wisconsin area, the Iowa, the Dakotas aren't well, in the Big pretty Ten. pretty much though. gave it to Illinois. Illinois had like 14 positive cases. Yeah. yeah like or it's, something like that the very next week, like this week. It's going to hit still them. They played Purdue. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. I just don't, I don't think Wisconsin, because – Say they do play Michigan on the 14th, but then they test positive again. That's it. They won't have enough. They won't have enough time to field enough games. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. So, um, I think if you're a Badger fan, I which think you might sucks, want to pick a, a pick a different team to root for a backup team. Which sucks because they are yep. they were going to be good. Conference. It looked like <laughs> yeah, looks like they were going to be legitimately good this year. Um, and finally fit that key that they've been missing in a quarterback, like good quarterback play. Cause that's all they've really been missing the last couple of years. Um, yeah. True. But we might not know. 
All right, before we get into the games, let's talk top ten. We're going 10. into our top ten. We're going into Wisconsin our top ten. Wisconsin makes it in Wisconsin might make an appearance in my top ten. Wisconsin is out of my top ten for these exact reasons of COVID. Would you like to start with your top ten or would you like me to start with my top ten who's got a couple spicy meatballs in where they're ranking? I'm ranking some teams. We can start I don't know, do you just wanna go bottom to top? Everybody That's what she said. Do you said. just wanna yeah. rotate? <laughs> you just want to rotate. <laughs> <laughs> we rotate the right or left. What are we doing here? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> On two? All right. Um yeah, we can go bottom to top. Um we're five. We're we're five years old here. Um yeah. yep. <laughs> at the ten spot, my ten spot right now, Miami, Florida. Um I don't like I don't think there's a lot of good football teams this year, to be completely honest. Like hand up in, in college football. I think once you move out of the top eight it's really i don't unless the pac-12 is going to surprise us oh shit we forgot to mention the pac-12 is coming back (laughs) (laughs) i mean wow (laughs) completely forgot about that sorry to the pac-12 you're you're continuing with the jokes aren't you (laughs) (laughs) i mean we know they're just going to be the snake that eats themselves like they are every year so why bother talking about it um they won't even be able to this year that's they only true. have like four or five games, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I do like. I think you. I, I feel bad because I do think USC was going to be somewhat competitive-ish, um, but we'll see. Um, okay, sorry. Miami ten defense is playing good, offense is not where it should be, but like it's good enough. And I couldn't, I couldn't justify another team at the top ten, which you'll see once we kind of fill out the rest of my bracket here, to say the well, least. Okay. So Miami's kind of in mind, but not quite there. I'm starting with Marshall at five and zero. I'm starting with the undefeated teams. Marshall, um, all right. Marshall has to be in it. They're five and zero. I mean, how can you yeah. not include them in this? And as crazy of a year as it's been right now, um, so I'm going with Marshall as my number ten team. All right, my number. My number ten is Coastal Carolina, uh, similar to uh, <laughs> Tim. With six and no, I mean Coastal Carolina is yeah. playing great football. They are, you know. So mm-hmm. I just did not see it coming. I thought I was so, going to have some spicy teams in my top I'm, ten. I can tell you right now, I did not see Coastal Carolina coming. And in there. I am jumping ahead of Nate here because Coastal Carolina is my number nine team in the top ten. You all are insane. Oh, um, <laughs> the way this season is going, I have to go with undefeated teams in the top ten. They're the only teams I get to talk about. <sighs> Okay. They only have a top ten. Fine. They gotta keep those two bottom spots are reserved for undefeated teams. If it if it helps, my number nine is Miami. Okay, good. That does yeah. help. <laughs> I was gonna say, man, my 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 list is gonna look like conventional. Coastal it's Carolina gonna is the only one that I have. Yeah. I, I just like Coastal Carolina. I wanted to go with the two undefeated teams, especially six and zero oh and five and zero. Oh. You don't have many of those, so. I mean. I have to go. You got a decent amount in the top ten right now, but okay, fine, fine. Number nine, I got Texas A and M. I don't know if they're gonna win this week. They might be in for a little bit of a trap game, but Texas A and M. I went back. I've watched some of their film. They're running the football well. I think Jimbo's got them in the right direction. I don't think they're gonna hold on to that necessarily, but I like them at number nine when I could stack them up to the rest of my, the rest of college football right now. Um, so I've got them as my number nine team. Um, I guess I could go with my eight. My eight's Florida. Florida, the reason I don't have them higher, Florida, and they will be higher if they beat Georgia this week, which we'll get to that game when we cover Literally. the games and the betting. But Florida's defense is such a liability. I can't I can't justify putting them in there because I know as soon as they play a team, like, yeah, they put up a shit ton of points, but as soon as they play a team with a competent defense and a competent offense, I think it's going to start to fall apart for them. Um, as well as Dan Mullins is not a big time coach. Like he, I mean, he is a big time coach. Don't get me wrong; he's a phenomenal coach. He he's great at getting you into the top ten, but he's never going to win the big. Game. He's not a big game winner. Like that's just he doesn't have the stones to win a big game, and he never has. So right. I can't, in good conscience, put them higher than eight until they beat Georgia. Until they prove it this weekend. If they prove it this weekend, then fuck it, put them in the top five. But um, right until they do that, I can't, in good conscience, put them higher. But they are phenomenal on offense it's insane how good they are offensively it's defense is a liability for me so the way i kind of wanted to do this was 
I kind of wanted to do the two undefeated teams down at the bottom and then work my way into the top. And when I brought up Wisconsin, it was Wisconsin, asterisk, Miami. Yeah. Now, I'm looking at my list, and I don't see BYU on there, so I'm going to add a third asterisk into this spot, and this is a placeholding spot for Wisconsin, for Miami, or BYU. For eight. We got a three-way tie. So we got a three-way tie for eight. We have Wisconsin, Miami, and BYU. Wisconsin is really only there just to mention them because if they don't come back, like, they're out, basically. Yeah. So it's really a Miami versus BYU for this eighth seed here. In my mind, and if BYU continues to go undefeated and they win this game, uh, yeah. Who are they playing this week again? Boise. It's a really good game. Boise, Boise, Boise yeah, State. Boise. 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 And if game. they win this game, they will. They will just. I'll be able to cross Wisconsin and Miami off of this list. So Not my honest. number, my number eight is going to give you an aneurysm. Maybe both of you. Um. And the only reason I'm picking them is, again, based on uh, Tim's assessment of that uh, undefeated. And this team has not played yet, but I believe they will go undefeated. My number eight is the Ducks. Oh, for fuck's sake. I knew it was going there. (laughs) I knew you were going there. Pac-12 is not even in. (laughs) They're not playing football this year, Dante. They're not playing football this year. That's it. That's my only. That's my last crazy team. But if they do, if they're they're not playing football, (laughs) look. The if they do, I think the Ducks are going to walk through the Pac-12. I guess. Sure. Pac-12 doesn't play football. I'll say the (laughs) Pac-12 just eats itself every year. So they're going to be in the top ten for like a hot second, and then they're going to play like Arizona or something and lay a big old egg. Um. (laughs) Not even Arizona State, which would be a respectable team to lose to. They're going to lose to, like, fucking Arizona. Um, you don't talk about Arizona State on this podcast. You're not an Arizona State fan? No. <laughs> you don't like Herm? No, you don't like not. You don't like the builder of men in Herm they're Edwards? The, he's the king of the 9-7 and seven win against <laughs> Michigan State. <laughs> and it drives me nuts every time I see that team. Uh, yeah, I hate Arizona State. All right, fair enough. Um, my seven BYU BYU. I fucking love BYU. I'll talk about them here when we talk about the Boise game. They're phenomenal. They're playing phenomenal offense, phenomenal defense. I'd have them higher, but the way my top six, I really like the structure of my top six. So I wanted to put them higher. I couldn't put them higher at this moment in time, but they might be creeping into the top five. They are so good. Um, that's my number seven team. I don't hate that. The next one I had, the one that Nate was really talking about, is Florida. Florida has the opportunity to jump right up to number five with this win. Um, but there's still some uncertainties, and that's why they lie at seven right now. Seven, I am going with the Bearcats, another undefeated team. Um, I, I, Cincinnati might be playing some of the best football that they can play. Their competition is just... Mm. not that great right and so um that might be a detriment to them but i I really like the football that the bearcats are playing phenomenal football um and i'll get to them in a second my number six team georgia georgia's number six for me right now the defense we it is phenomenal like watching them they're phenomenal but they haven't played anybody great so this week is going to be the perfect test to be like is this the best defense in the country or have they just been playing really shitty offenses and looking like the best defense in the country? Don't get me wrong. They're still going to be a top-tier defense. But how good are they is going to be put to the test this week. The offense is such a liability. I don't know why um, – what's his face? JT Daniels? Stetson Bennett. Why is he JT not the – Daniels. So I heard a conspiracy theory. Oh, boy. We're back. Through the Georgia message <laughs> What did we just talk about with conspiracy theories making no on this show? Theories, but they talked about it briefly – on the Barstool podcast, Unnecessary Roughness, their college football show. And they have a known conspiracy theorist on that podcast. Okay. But they said that JT Daniels um, has been cleared by his doctors, but not by his insurance policy. Mm. What? And that's why he's not able to play. So he took out an insurance policy on himself for getting hurt. Right. He got hurt. Now, the insurance policy doesn't want to allow him, the people that are 
keeping his insurance policy in place does not want to does not think he's ready to go back. If the doctor actuaries. says he's ready. Why? How does the insurance company still have say over it? Isn't it once the there's there's money. Yeah, I money. I get there's money, but the, he would essentially could, just be they, suing they him. They might he's... make his insurance policy invalid if he puts himself at an unnecessary risk. Yep. But that's just playing football. Like he has an insurance policy for playing an unnecessary sport, and if the doctors Don't are clear, like I could see maybe getting two opinions. Companies make sense, Nate. Have you ever gotten insurance for anything before? <laughs> I have. I do. Um, <laughs> have you ever tried to make a claim? I, I have. Unfortunately, yeah, exactly. Um, I don't. I I hear what you're saying. I just. If the doctors, if you, like, I get maybe he has to get two opinions or something, but if the doctors are saying he's fine then I don't understand how you prevent him from potentially making money the thing you were insuring for. Because you're yeah. insuring if he gets injured, might, he can't make money. But if he can't play, then he can't make money. But they might be saying, like, yes, you're cleared to play, but the risk of you getting hurt again is so high before you go to the NFL draft that we don't want you to play the rest of this year. I guess then in that case, would he then be able to take out – and this is getting way off topic – but if he's if he's we that if he's that injured, was, this was a conspiracy if he's theory. that, I have no details on this, Nate. If he's that I did injured, not dive into the Georgia message boards to to confirm or deny. But if you're our expert on insurance, write in, let us know. Yeah, let me know if you're an insurance right. agent. Uh, because in my head, I'm now thinking like, well, if he's hurt that bad to the point where he can't play, therefore not improve his draft stock, wouldn't he be able to claim his insurance then because he got an injury that wouldn't allow him to go to the league? So either way, they're going to have to pay out. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about insurance. <laughs> All right, fuck it. Whatever. I'm done with this conspiracy theory. We're moving on. I just don't know why he isn't playing. But, yeah, Stenson Benson, that's why they're uh, that's why they're sixth, is that offense, it, it gives me – the jeepers creepers like i i do not like what i see it makes me want to vomit sometimes when i watch the georgia offense and the funny thing too is if kirby smart hadn't messed it up and in hindsight it looked bad at the time i was like yeah jake Fromm's great but if they had kept justin fields university of georgia would be the number one team in this country right now and we wouldn't even be a conversation not only justin fields but if they had kept jamie newman there like what happened to him i mean that's why George is also my number six team. They don't have a quarterback. Like Stetson Bennett is not it. He's not that good. He's not terrible, but he's not it. Um, so that's why they're my number six program as well. And why why would you why would you let Jamie Newman? Well, he just opted out. out yeah, I guess. Out. Yeah. But I, from my feeling, I always thought that he opted out because JT Daniels was promised the job. Apparently that's not the case because he's not playing. I thought he just thought he was going to go to the end. Like he he just didn't want to risk the health concerns. Really, Maybe that's part of it. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was he didn't want to risk the health concerns for his NFL career. But in my head, I was like, you only have an NFL career if you play good because play. like yeah. you didn't you didn't that's, play you didn't play so good at Vanderbilt not- that you're like this aw shuck quarterback that's going to get draft drafted in the first round. Um, Forest, right? What okay. or Wake Forest? Sorry, yeah. yeah, yeah. Their color okay. schemes are very similar, so I, just, I know they're the exact I f- same. Yeah, colors, I flipped the. But... I saw the uniform <laughs> and I just flipped it in my head. Um, but yeah, it's. But yeah, if he had Justin's Fields, I mean, we wouldn't even be talking about any other football program right now. We'd be like, yeah. George is going to win the national championship. Why even have a season? <laughs> my number six is a team that's already already been brought up, so we won't spend enough time, a lot of time on it. But it's Florida. Ah yes, Florida. Good okay. Florida. This game, I mean, this game this week, which we're gonna get here in a second, is gonna be phenomenal. My number five, UC. UC's playing the best God football right it, now. Nate. We have the exact same top. <laughs> <laughs> top six. I don't I have your garbage it. Marshall in my whatever, but uh, I said top six. I didn't say top. Yeah, ten. top six. I said top six. Lou Fickle's amazing. They're playing such good football on both sides. The defense fantastic. Yes, they don't have an insane tough schedule, but the teams they're playing, they're smoking. And the one team that you can point to that's like, this is a ranked team, this is a good team, SMU, they smoked them. Um, And so when you do something like that, and it doesn't even look like they're in the same league, I have to respect you as a top-tier team like that. You have a shot, not really to get into the playoffs because the way this is going to shake out, probably not, but like you're top five for sure. I do think they have a shot to get in the playoffs. They're going to have to have a lot of pieces fall in place as far as teams losing. Uh, Granted, they don't play anybody spectacular, but they're not playing like 
the bottom of the barrel this year. Like they're not. It's not like UC's coming out of the MAC. That's true. The problem is though, the SEC is going to get their champion in. The Big Ten is going to get their champion in. The ACC is going to get their champion in. So that's three spots right there. And then mm-hmm. if Notre Dame's only loss is to Clemson, or say they beat Clemson this time, barely lose to Clemson in the ACC championship, do you put them in? Do you put in a one yeah, loss? Yeah, COVID like, though too. Like why would you let? Notre yeah. Dame back in if they've already lost. Why would you let Clemson back in if they've already lost? I don't Might disagree. Well. I'm just saying it's it's tough. Like they're gonna have to have Throw some things. Caution to the wind and let you see in. There's gonna be have some things that have to fall into place, and they got to win out. But I'm just saying they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing and or blowing. BYU. Yeah, don't or BYU. Exactly. Yeah. BYU is doing the same thing. They're beating who they should beat, and they're doing it in convincing fashion. So, mm-hmm. like, that's what you have to do if you're one of these teams to be in the argument. And I think you see at this point in the argument, BYU might jump them in my rankings this week if they come out and they play really well, which I think they will against Boise State, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, yeah. But that's my that's my uh, number five team. Well, that's my number five team as well. Cool. So. <laughs> my, num- my number five team is BYU because, as Nate pointed out, they are beating who they're supposed to be, except – that uh, what was it? What was that? UTSA. They only beat them by oh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. But uh, other than that, BYU is is going to be an issue for uh the college football playoffs because they the teams that they're playing aren't that great, but they are beating them um by large point uh by large spreads. So and BYU is just playing fun football. Like I enjoy watching BYU games because you know they're going to be explosive, explosive on both sides of the ball. Oh. And I don't know if there's too many teams out there that that you're like, oh yeah, they're consistent, consistently good on both sides. Yeah, you could flip those two. I think, in my opinion, I I put it to UC mm-hmm. just because the coaching. I, I think Luke Fickle gives them a little bit of the edge, but you could absolutely make the argument to flip those two. A hundred percent agree with that. Uh, my number four is Notre Dame, which we're going to find out this weekend if they really are. Um, but that's my number four. I think our, my top four doesn't need much talking. I'm just going to give it. Notre Dame, Ohio State, Bama, Clemson is where I'm at. But that's going to sort itself out real quick this weekend, which we'll talk about here in a second. Ditto. <laughs> yeah. well, mine, Literally the exact same. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> my, my Notre Dame, uh, Clemson, OSU, and Bama. Bama. Okay. I, you have Clemson down at number three. Yeah, that's impressive, okay. but <laughs> that's fair. I guess. I mean, As the way they played last week against Boston College, it wasn't because Trevor Lawrence wasn't in the game. No, it was not. <laughs> no, but it was a good comeback win. Uh, which we'll talk about Clemson here in a second. Let's just kick off the games because we need to do it. We're starting off Friday with a banger. I'm talking. This is shootout at the OK Corral. Zach Wilson, who should be the favorite for the Heisman, I think, in my opinion, front runner. He's got over 2,000 passing yards, 19 TDs, two interceptions, completing 70% of his passes. He's electric on offense. He is Wyatt Earp. Uh, you got the big blue turf machine in Boise State going at it. Where do we feel about this game right now? Oh, I should also give the line. Sorry. I really know too much. BYU's really minus BYU's. three. Over under is at 61. <clears throat> this is I've a got but, BYU so, minus three and a half because the way they've been just rolling over teams. This is a must win for BYU. If BYU loses this game, that I believe that's the end of their season, right? If they can't beat yeah. this ranked team, because there's no other, they're not going to play another ranked team unless something crazy happens. Um, I think this game, though, oh, I'm going to sound like a bad sports analyst here, is definitely going to come down to defense, right? If if Boise State can stop BYU um, from scoring easy points or, or limit explosive plays, to use that uh, cliche, I think Boise State has a shot to win. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the blue turf is always an advantage right there, but that's baked in, I think. Um, BYU's defense is stifling. I think they're letting up 12 points a game right now. The offense is so electric. If you haven't... Um, if you haven't watched that offense... Um, play it's insane. It's so much fun to watch. Zach Wilson should it's be so should be the favorite to do it um, for Heisman at least at this point. In my opinion, it's insane what he's put he's doing week in week out. That's it. I, I mean, I like. Yeah, BYU. I would agree. I, I like BYU in this game. I I think it's a put up or shut up type of a game for them, and I mean we'll see. I don't know 
to be honest, I don't know much about Boise State and how they've been playing. I have been watching BYU. They're so good. I'm expecting. I mean, Boise State uh, sort of by Boise good. State. I mean, they play really good defense. Okay. They run the ball. And then their quarterback, um, I can't think of his name right now. I think he's a little iffy for this game. But he's playing. Like, it's a typical sort of, like, they're not as good as those classic uh, P- uh, Peterson uh BYU or BYU Boise State teams, Boise State, yeah. but they're very they're very competitive. Like they're a well rounded football team, um, I would say, okay. from what I've seen. Sears. Um, but I got BYU winning that game. Uh, another game on on Friday night. We don't think it's not on my card, but I think it's worth mentioning. Miami versus NC State. NC State's dog mascot died. That might give them a little bit oh. of a motivational oh. bo- uh, push. But um, rest in power, doggy. Yeah, the the Miami Florida they're just playing they're playing really good defense like that. That Miami Florida defense looks like a Miami Florida defense. The offense also looks like a Miami Florida offense though, and it, it's it's weird right now. It's kind of clunky. I feel like when I watch them. Um, I don't really have much to add to that. Yeah, I, I wasn't. I didn't plan on watching that game. <laughs> let's let's talk about a game. Oh, here we're not going to talk about the Pac-12, but it. Does kind of suck that they're having to play at nine in the morning their time. Did you guys see this? Like USC I'm Arizona State right kicks Arizona off at State, noon. Yeah, yeah that sucks. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, that's part of their plan to try to if build. You're thinking about if you're thinking about the Pac-12 though, that's like your like marquee matchup, right? Yeah. Oh, Oh, hundred percent. I mean, the Arizona Oregon battle? game later at night is, but like this is part of their plan to build a bigger present on the East Coast. But at the same and. This year hurts them because, like, the best thing about the Pac-12 is, like, in normal pre-COVID times, you're at the bar or you're going mm-hmm. out and you can watch the Pac-12 game going on the TV. Like, that's that's what I love about the Pac-12 is, like, yeah, they're, they're like the a night game. 10, 15 game. Yeah, I mean, they got the yeah. Oregon-Stanford game, but, like, I agree. And, like, this game is going to start at 9 their time. So, like, the time that they're going to have to get up to, like, eat, get to the stadium, warm up, get ready, like, that sucks. This is gonna be a <laughs> so are you game. hammering the under in this game? Probably, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm kind of thinking that, Nate. <laughs> Honestly, it's not I'm a bad idea. the under in this game. That's a 57 and a half. I get it at 58 right now, but, yeah, it's that's crazy. Sorry, that was a quick note. Let's get to another game, too. Michigan-Indiana. This game, I'm interested on your thoughts here because we just talked at length about Michigan. I don't know if Indiana has it in them to pull this off. Like, I don't Indi- know. Do we think Michigan gets right right back on the train track here and gets a Indiana little bit Indiana with the upset. <laughs> you hear it here first. I don't know how I feel. No, I don't I can, know. That's not I my can never, I, I can never get a hold on Michigan. Whenever I think they're going to blow a team out, they don't, and they might get upset. Whenever I think they're not going to do well and they're they have a uh, they have a chance to be an upset, they blow them out. So here I could see Indiana playing well, but I really didn't think they looked that great against Penn State. They no, they shouldn't have won that win, game. But I don't think they looked that great. And Michigan, I I, I just don't know how I feel about them. I'm staying away I just from this I don't like perspective. Them. Like I'm staying far away from this game betting perspective because I don't know if Michigan gets back on their tracks and looks good here, or if Indiana picks up that momentum from the Penn State game, which they should have lost, but they started to get it going. Tom Allen's a good coach. It's a competitive football team, but I don't know if they have the stones in them to win this so game. The line is kind of what's throwing me off at the three and a half. It's like right. That's what's really messing with my mind. If it was seven one way or another, that's kind of where. I would feel a little bit more confident picking one or the other. That's um, 100% right. But yeah. at three and a half, it's just has a weird line that I don't, I don't like know it. how I feel. I mean, that's like, against, that's like pick a winner. Against ranked teams, Harbaugh is not good. So that's the other that's thing true. that you have to. You <laughs> that's factor very in true. There. And Indiana is ranked 13th. So there's a chance that he just won't perform against a ranked team. So what does it mean to be an underdog going into the game? Like you remember the like the stat betting that I brought up, 0 oh, and fourteen is an underdog. Is, a is that underdog. just on a point spread? Yeah. I think it's or, a point spread. Yeah. Right? Or is that it's on the... a lower ranked team? I don't remember what the stat was that Valeni rattled off, but I know he said 0 oh, and fourteen is an underdog. And now I don't know if that's betting or if that's I'd a hundred percent go with it. It's betting. I would think it yeah, would be it's betting. betting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's betting for sure. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, betting. 
So that um, makes me hate it even more. I mean, ESPN is predicting, although the, F- the FPI is probably one of the worst things in, <laughs> that you could look at, but ESPN is predicting uh, Indiana to win this game. Yeah. Um, Florida, Georgia, one of the craziest games probably every year, I feel like. One of the premier SEC games. The line's at three and a half right now. Georgia is the favorite over under 52 and a half. I'm staying the hell away from this game betting wise because I have no idea. We talked about it earlier as to why we had Georgia ranked lower. The offense, I don't know what I'm going to get out of them. And I, mm-hmm. my inclination is to go Florida because they can put up so many points in Georgia. It's just not going to be able to stay with them. But then there's the other part of me that's going, well, defense is king sometimes. But we see in the SEC, like when that mentality happens sometimes, though, the offense does that ultimately prevail. We've seen this with Alabama all the time, um, especially when they play Georgia. Like I feel like if if I'm if you're asking me what do I lean, I think I lean Florida here because of how powerful that offense is. But I hate this because Dan- I also don't like Dan Mullins in big games. I prefer Kirby Smart, and I prefer a defense right now. But that Georgia offense, I can't state it enough. It's it's bad, man. It's really bad. See, I kind of lean Georgia in this game, and and I start to like Georgia if JT Daniels comes out as a starter in this game. Oh, that if, changes if, it all. If you if you watch JT Daniel run through that run through that tunnel and is the guy leading them out, like I would hammer Georgia in this game. But if it's still Stetson Bennett, like I would agree with you. I just stay away from it. There's no reason to get in on this. Hundred percent, hundred percent agree with that. Um, just sit back and watch, I think, is, is the way I'm approaching this game. Um, that's the way I would go, too. I don't know if we have any other thoughts there, but that's sort of how I'm approaching it. Um, game of the week. Game of the night. The big one. The big kahuna. Clemson versus Notre Dame. Lines at six. Clemson's favorite at six. over under 52. I tweeted this out. I, I don't It would have had to have been Saturday. Booger had the audacity to say losing Trevor Lawrence did not matter for this game, as if losing arguably the best quarterback in college football wouldn't matter. There's a reason this line is at six right now, Booger, because of that. It 100% matters to lose the best player in college football, arguably. Um, Where do we feel on this game? Because I am all over the place here on this game right now. To be honest, Nate, I do think Notre Dame can pull this off. Yeah, but Brian... Their defense is incredible, and Clemson struggled against Boston College. And yeah, but they picked it up in because... the second half. But they didn't struggle because of the quarterback. Okay, but just like Jim Harbaugh, Brian Kelly is terrible against This is my teams. point that I was going to get to. Yep. 100%. Yeah, he, he, he cannot coach in big games. So that's the... Like, I... I like. Yeah, and the worst home. part about this game, Clemson is two and five against the spread, and Notre Dame is two and four against the spread. Oh, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> what, who are you supposed to pick? Yeah, this is another game. I'm staying away. This might be a gut, like a gut. Once I've gotten a couple, couple in me on Saturday, I might make a gut pick here. So watch out for that on one of our social media platforms, <coughs> Twitter at Trophy Kids Podcast. Um, but I'm with you, dude. Brian Kelly drops some eggs in big games and the defense don't get me wrong i've watched every notre dame game and the defense is definitely good but it's not like they played spectacular offenses and they do feel like a defense from what i've been watching where if it breaks it breaks hard like they are a dam loaded with tnt waiting for a fuse to be lit because if that fuse gets lit it does feel like they kind of get in their own headspace and then they just like the defense just kind of blows I mean, just for just for the audience, uh, the Irish are three and eight against top ten teams. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that, <laughs> that would be under the Brian Kelly era too. I am assuming. Yes, that's what Brian you're, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't like that either. But I also don't like Clemson so because, now like, I don't know. the offense performed fine. But I also think, like, I do think Clemson f- falls victim to the. P- they do have a problem getting up for some games, and I can't tell. I know it's true for some games, but I can't really tell when it's they're having trouble getting up for this game and like really getting excited. They just kind of thought they'd roll the ball out and just whoop team versus their legitimately struggle. I think the BC game was a legitimate struggle. BC is also a good football team, but then you saw them put it together in the second half. Like that second half team looked much different. 
Um, and they got the good comeback from behind win. They still got a phenomenal running back in NTN. Phenomenal. Top, top world-class running back. Um, I don't know. I just I don't like this line either. Um, I think this yeah. is another sit back and wait. But if you ask me which way I'm leaning, I think I lean Clemson, but maybe Notre Dame to cover. Because the other thing with Notre Dame is Notre Dame's offense only gets going when the running game gets going. And that could be a problem because Clemson will stuff the run. They do have a phenomenal running game. They got a great offensive line at Notre Dame. But if you're if you're saying we got to run the ball to be successful here, Clemson can stuff that and can stop that. That's yeah, like I that's their special sauce right there. <laughs> here's my um thing. This game right here uh is going to make the argument that uh Notre Dame should stay in ACC and not be independent. 100%. Like this, yeah, this game because of the matchup, because of where, I, like I don't know what other game you would actually watch. Right, you're gonna watch this Notre Dame Clemson and Notre Dame should just stay in the ACC. Also, I, I don't think Brian Kelly pulls this off. Yeah, I don't either. It'll be interesting. Uh, they are good at home, but you don't get the huge home advantage, even though they do have fans. I mean, Touchdown Jesus is still there, right? He is still there. He sure is. I think Touchdown Jesus got a little upset with me calling myself the Notre Dame whisperer in a spite of me sense because I've been catching some very bad breaks. Like that first half cover last week, that should have been easy in the books, but of course they fumble the ball on the fucking 15 yard line for a run back touchdown. Like, give me a break, dude. Um, they didn't score at all. That offense couldn't move the ball. And that was the easiest cover ever. And they fumble it. Ah, whatever. I'm over it. Um, any other games before we give out our card or I give out a card here. I don't know, Tim, if you have one this week, I was going to say, I was, was scrolling through these games, trying to come up with a card and I don't have one. So I've got a short one. You give out your card. This week, Stanford I, and Oregon. Oh yeah, 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 I I think Oregon's just. I don't know yeah. much about Oregon. I'm not going to bet it because I'd rather watch them. But I think Stanford's about to be really bad this year, and I'm yeah, talking that's what really I bad. Mm-hmm. I think that too. I think Stanford is probably going to be like, oh, can we cancel the season because we want to cancel the season? Yeah, they should have pulled the UConn. Yeah, we're too and opted smart out. to have another season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they should have pulled the UConn and opted out um, for sure. I, I don't know about the spread there. I'm going to watch. I want to watch all the Pac-12 teams and try to get a feel, especially because Oregon's got a new quarterback. I want to see how that all goes. Um, but they play good defense. So, yeah, I think they should probably crush Stanford. Um, I feel like 10 is, is a pretty good bet. Um, but I didn't look at that game hard enough. Um, I've got a short card. I hate the board this week. I feel like every line is either – like I feel like Vegas locked in this week because in every game – I'm looking at it, and it's like, I'm either going to hit this or I'm going to miss it by a million miles. Like, it's just going to be a massive blowout. Um, so I'm, I'm being a little selective in this. First game, I got Liberty plus 14 versus Virginia Tech. I'm from Virginia. I'm going to tell you right now in the state of Virginia, Virginia Tech is obviously king. And the state of Virginia gets doesn't, I think, get the rep it deserves as an actual good football state. Like, it's a phenomenal football state. It, it, it's not Texas or California, obviously, but it's up there as one of the top-tier football states. And within the state, the colleges, they get going to beat Virginia Tech when they play. You saw it with JMU in 2010. They beat them. You saw it with Old, the Old Dominion. Uh, what was that, like two years ago? I don't know if Liberty's going to beat them, but Virginia Tech is really bad on defense, and they're really good on offense, and that's a dangerous combination for a Virginia Tech team versus a Liberty team who is going to get up for this. Hugh Freeze is looking like this is a statement game for him to get back into the national conversation for a coaching job. So I do think they're going to play this game very competitive. And I think Virginia Tech has some real concern because that defense is bad um, for Virginia Tech right now. All I got to say is I hope you're right about Virginia football and that we have ourselves our next quarterback in Noah Kim. It's a great state. I'm telling you right now, it turns out athletes. It's a phenomenal state for football. I grew up in the state. It's I think it's well underrated. It's starting to get a better rap, but it produces some insane athletes um, and some really good football players. So, um, I yeah, that's what I have to say. I'm from the northern Virginia part of the area, which is phenomenal football. Um, think, like, remember the Titans country? Like, I'm from that part of Virginia. Um, they're not good at football anymore, right? Or at least when I was in high school, they weren't. Um, but the whole area is great, and the whole state is good. Um, UC minus 13 is what I got it at. 13.5, uh, sorry. 
Arkansas plus two is playing Tennessee. Jeremy Pruitt has to win this game, but here's the problem. Tennessee has no fight in them. That's a dead team, and Arkansas has a lot of fight. Arkansas is the epitome of it's not the size of the dog, but it's the size of the fight in the dog because they have a lot of fight in that team. You know, Arkansas it, is really good. And by really good, I mean, like, surprising for an Arkansas team. Very surprising. I feel like this is like a – I feel like they're at their peak right now, and they could turn into LSU next year where they lose both of their coordinators because of how good their coordinators are playing on offense and defense. I, I have to uh, commend Tennessee for keeping with college tradition and getting to what basically is kind of a little bit – like the middle of the year and being like, nope, we're done playing football. <laughs> <We're done. laughs> At least they, even during COVID, they they performed the same way. Oh, terrible, terrible program. Um, but I love, I like Arkansas in that spot. I got BYU minus three. I got Memphis minus eighteen. I think Memphis is going to get back on track here. They're playing the University of South Florida, who is a horrendously bad team. Memphis got the shit kicked out of them by UC. I mean, they got embarrassed. Um, in one of the easiest bets of the year for me. Um, and they have a really good offense. They don't have a great defense, but South Florida's offense is – it's poke your eyeballs out bad um, to watch. So I like them at minus 18. And then your Michigan State Sparties versus Iowa. I think I like the under here. This feels like a 14-17 type of game. Oh, you know it's going to be. <laughs> the under over is 46. This oh, feels 14-17 yeah. written yeah. all yeah. over it. <laughs> Let's not go 14-17. Let's go another 9-7 win for the Sparties right there. Yeah, I don't, I don't, this, this is my thing. Like When I saw, like, oh, yeah, we're playing Iowa. Like I knew we were playing Iowa, but it, the realization that we were playing Iowa, I was like, man, MSU can go right in there and play a close game and lose. Nope, <laughs> can't they? <laughs> yep, they sure can. So that one's oh at 46. My. That's it. That's all I have for my card this Is week. Is that all? Do we want to talk about this uh, circle back to something earlier that we brought up in the podcast, how Nebraska's getting sc- they're just slapped left and right by the Big Ten? They're underdogs against Northwestern right now. They should be underdogs against Northwestern. Northwestern. How awesome would that be? <laughs> Northwestern, <laughs> Northwestern uh, is going to go three, can go three and zero, oh, right? You mean zero and three? <laughs> Northwestern? Oh, oh, Northwestern. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Could go three and zero. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't think I said Nebraska. it would be three and zero. Oh. No, I heard Nebraska. I I had my mind fixated on Nebraska. Yeah, I, I Nebraska isn't a good team. Uh-huh. They are not. Also, we talked about Franklin and Harbaugh. Uh, Frost should have been right in that conversation. He yeah. could be close. But he, Nebraska yeah. is also Nebraska. Nebra- yeah, Nebraska is Nebraska. I think he's got a little bit more wiggle room because he's a little newer. But, yeah, I mean, they. I think Nebraska just has to accept that nobody's going to want to come play for Nebraska. Why would you play for ne- – like, if you're choosing to play at Nebraska, why wouldn't you just choose to play at Wisconsin if you got an offer or, like, Iowa or something? Like, why would you go out to Lincoln, Nebraska to play for Nebraska? It's or Scott stay in Texas. Yeah, or stay in Texas, yeah. <laughs> stay in Texas at one of the, the – One, one of the schools? many That's schools, what, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have lots of opportunities to stay in Texas over trying to go to um, – Nebraska. Or you, you know, if you don't want to go too far from Texas, you can go to Oklahoma, you can go to LSU, you can go to Arkansas, yeah, you know, Oklahoma you can... State. You could go. I mean, yeah, they're yeah. all like right there. You have to drive through so many schools to try and get to Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, any other games you want to cover before we wrap this up? Cool. Mm, Let's so. finalize it up here, Tim. You let me know that you had a Trophy Kids Millennial of the Week award here so, this week. I wanted to bring this up because I thought it was fascinating for a team that I love. And I shot this over to Dante, and he didn't really understand what was going on. Um, but my Trophy Kids Millennial of the Week, and this may be the wrong person to give credit to, but I'm going to give this to Darian Harris of Michigan State, one of the football coaches that they brought in who's our age, and he's already left Michigan State as a star linebacker, and now he's come back as their coach, and he is pumping the shit out of Michigan State players' Instagram and Twitter following, telling them to build a brand, which is such a millennial thing to do, (laughs) and setting themselves up to make more money 
after college. So I'm looking at this thing that Michigan State football tweeted out, and it is of Ricky White, their true freshman wide receiver, who balled out in the game against Michigan, and they are specifically spelling out his Instagram following increase and then his Twitter following increase. They are showing counts go up before the game and after the game. They are showing his following go from 4,000 on Instagram to 14,000. I'm watching him wipe it out as we speak and increase that much. And I really think that's why Michigan State pulled Imani Bates as early as they did. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why their football team is back to recruiting big time players and they will be back to re recruiting big time players. It may not have paid off them for them necessarily yet, but it's something to watch. And ladies and gentlemen, I didn't get it cause I was knee deep in watching these, <laughs> these races and these, uh, in the uh, States. So I wasn't really paying attention, but no, Tim is right. Building a brand is very important, especially for, there's so many kids on these teams, and obviously everybody is not going to the NFL. There are limited spots there, but for them to be able to build a brand and, and sustain themselves, you know, after their four or five years in college is very, very important. And, you know, obviously shout out to Darian Harris, but I think we should probably shout out the graphics department. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Whoever they hired. Uh, whoever for they are. Yeah. As well. <laughs> I just know that I saw it from Darian Harris retweeting the Michigan State football account, and that's what I originally saw him saying, build a brand. Um, so it's one thing to be said for a school putting a player in a situation where they can leave school with a significant following on Instagram and be, or Twitter and being able to turn that into real dollars once they leave school. Yes. 100%. 100% agree. Invaluable. Um, any other final thoughts before we wrap this bad boy up? Indiana upset. All right, Indiana upset. We got that. <laughs> you heard it here first. Heard it here first. I have not called from, from Dante. I yeah. do not. I you from I Dante is what we got this week. <laughs> no, but play. I have not called a single game right. So just you know, just in case. That's the Dante play of the week. Um, yeah. All right, that'll do it for us. The NFL podcast will probably not come out. I'm going to see if I can grab my roommate to maybe do that, but that might not be coming out this week because i got to do anniversary stuff tomorrow, Friday, when this is, you're listening to this. So um, might not come out this week, but I will post the card uh, onto our social media platform, so make sure you're following at Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Um, but that'll do it for us here, and as always, peace. Peace. peace.